أعوذ بالله من الشيطان العين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء وخاتم المرسلين سيدنا ونبينا بالقاسم محمد ولا أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهر المعصومين ولا نتدام الباقي على عدائهم من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين أما بعد شهر رمضان الذي أنزل فيه القرآن بيّه هدى للناس وبينات من الهدى والفرقان صلوات من أكبر We have been looking at Surah Al-Hadith, Surah number 57 of the Qur'an, and uh, we we'll look at ayat number 16 uh, this evening. As those of you who have been following uh, the program for the last uh, six days, uh, basically when we look at the main theme, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about two things. One is Iman and the other is Infaq. And basically Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is urging the mu'mineen to attain high, higher levels of iman. The primary focus on the ayat that we discussed was towards the mu'mineen. So that they, would, they should realize that you know, just to be born in a Muslim family, in a family of mu'mineen is not sufficient. You have to, you know, that was just the beginning. And he had to uh, work hard to go to the higher levels. And that is the theme again. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after talking about the issue of infaq, comes back to this issue of iman. And if you look at this ayat, we will only look at the half of it uh, this evening. And the rest, inshallah, we'll deal with it tomorrow. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Alam ya'ani lil-ladheena amanu an taqsha qulubuhum. لِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ وَمَا نَزَلَ مِنَ الْحَقِّ This is what we'll discuss this evening. وَلَا يَكُونُ كَالَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْكِتَابِ مِنْ قَابْلِ فَطَالَ عَلَيْهِمُ الْعَمَدِ فَقَصَدْ قُلُوبُهُمْ قَصَدْ قُلُوبُهُمْ وَكَثِيرٌ مِنْهُمْ فَاسِقُونَ The first two lines, has not the time yet come for those who believe that their hearts should be humbled by the remembrance of Allah and that has uh, and what has come down of the truth. Now, this is again, the, the wordings are, if you look at the style of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, malakum, when he talked about uh, infaq, you know, what is the matter with you? Why you are not giving in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? It's the same kind of tone that Allah is using here where he's saying, alam ya'ni, has not the time come that you who believe should now have khushu of your hearts. Means your heart should now become humble. So basically Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that to become a mu'min nominally is the beginning. Now that you have gone through this process, you know, it is time for you to reach to a level where you have khushu in your heart. Now what is, uh, what is this issue of uh, khushu? Before that, let us, you know, look at this uh, process of Iman. The difference between Iman and Islam. And there is, that's a topic by itself, but I'll just summarize that in two sentences. Islam is a matter of tongue. Iman is the issue of the heart. The difference between the tongue and the heart can be ears. The journey. You know, so anyone who says, La ilaha illallah, Muhammadun Rasulullah, Aliyun Waliullah, is nominally is a mu'min. We will believe in that person, a mu'min or a mu'mina. Yeah, but w w when we talk about you know, Islam and Iman, anyone who says the kalima, we will consider them to be Muslim, but when it comes to the issue of Iman, they must have that conviction and yaqeen in their hearts. The other difference between Iman and uh, Islam is that Islam is for this dunya only. The benefit of Islam. Anyone who says the kalima, we don't have a choice, you know, but to accept that individual as a Muslim. You know, he will be, all the rights of a Muslim will apply on him. All the obligations of the Muslims will apply on him. Uh, you know, the issues of marriage and other things will, only, will, will be equally, you know, applied in that case. But does that guarantee salvation in the hereafter? 
Najat in the, in the hereafter does not depend on Islam, that depends on Iman. So that, keep, keep that in mind that there's a major difference. And therefore, when we look at our first Imam, Ali bin Abi Talib, alayhi salatu wa salam, Have you ever heard the term for him, Amir al Muslimin? No. We call him Amir al Mu'mineen. Because really, what is, what is the important element is the issue of Iman, which is in heart. And there is actually an, uh, an ayat very clear on this issue in Surah Al Hujarat, uh, where some people had come, the Bedouins from uh, Arabian desert, into Medina when they were going through famine, they heard there is somebody called by Muhammad in Medina, is a new religion and he has the system of zakat. So they said, okay, we are hungry, let's go there. And they went there and they said, you know, la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, now give us zakat. They didn't say we are Muslim, they said we are mu'min. And the ayat came down, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, that our Rasul say to them, that do not call yourself mu'min. At the most, you can only say we have accepted Islam. The Iman has not yet reached to your hearts. So Islam and Iman are completely two different things. Yes, they are deserving of zakat because of the dunya issue. But when you talk about akhirah and the salvation in the hereafter, we need Iman. So this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, now he's talking to the mu'mineen. He says... أَلَمْ يَأْنِي لِلَّذِينَ آمَنْ وَانْتَخْشَعْ قُلُوبُهُمْ لِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ Has not the time yet come for those who have Iman to reach to a higher level? And how do we test that higher level or know, discover that? One sign is, you know, khushu of the heart, the, the humility of the heart. How, how is that, you know, uh, when we talk about khashi' The heart becomes khashi' and this is from khushu, which is humility or humbleness of uh, outside as well as inside. Internal humility as well as external. Means it is not only zahiri, it is also batini uh, in the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now how does the heart become khashi'? <clears throat> That's where we see two elements in this ayat that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about. لِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ وَمَا نَزَلَ مِنَ الْحَقِّ Two things. Number one is the zikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Remembrance of Allah. Not zikr in a verbal sense only. We'll talk more about it. It means to have the consciousness of Allah's presence in our life. That is the zikr. And the second is مَا نَزَلَ مِنَ الْحَقِّ What has come down of the truth. And this is the Qur'an. Reading the Qur'an should create this khushu' and humility in the hearts of the mu'mineen. We'll look at it, inshallah, tomorrow, the second part of it. Here I just would like to share a couple of slides from a uh, talk I had given, I think, a year and a half ago in the program of the converts, those who had, or they don't call themselves converts, they would like to call themselves reverts. They have come, we have come back to Islam. Because, you know, Islam believes that every child is born as a as a Muslim. And the topic that given to me was the issue of the spiritual health of the, uh, of the heart. And just two things here to understand that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the khushu of the qalb, you know, this humility of the heart, it means the heart goes through different situations. You know, just as we have this physical heart, and qalb here doesn't mean this physical heart, you know, behind the, uh, the chest, but it's basically we are talking about the spiritual heart. But just as the physical heart goes through the phases of healthy or diseased heart, you know, uh, similarly the spiritual heart also can go through different phases. If you look at the element of nifaq, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that, وَفِي قُلُوبِهِمْ marad, In their hearts there is a disease, a sickness. So the spiritual heart also can become sick. And there is also a heart which is uh, healthy. You know, one of the ayats uh, is where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says 
The successful is the person who comes to Allah bi qalbin salim, which who comes with a good and a healthy heart to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not in a physical sense. We are talking about spiritually healthy uh, heart. And so if you look at the function of the physical uh, heart, um, basically what does it do? Pumps blood through the, throughout the body thereby delivers oxygen and removes carbon dioxide. That is the function of the physical heart. How do you maintain the physical heart? Through exercise, number one, good diet, which is not part of our diet anyway, and to keep the heart clean and drug-free. Okay, this is just a very sim simple way of looking at it. Then you look at the same scenario when you talk about the function of the physical heart, you know, the function is that it pumps blood throughout the, throughout the body. And how does that happen? You can maintain it by exercise, good diet, and clean heart. On the spiritual side, what does this spiritual heart do? It doesn't pump blood, but it shows light, the nur which is in our life, on a spiritual level. And how does that come through? How does the spiritual heart give light? Number one, zikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number two, amal salih, good deeds. And number three, tawbah. We are not masum, we are not infallible. We have to constantly get rid of the um, you know, negativity in the spiritual heart by the process of tawbah. So let us look at the first element there, which is zikr. Uh, part of this ayat, لِذِكْرِ wa ma nazala min al haq Zikr basically, basically is the food or the fuel, nutrition for the spiritual heart. It needs that. Uh, without that, it would not be a healthy heart. Now, what do we mean by zikr? And this is where I think it's important to understand the levels of zikr. You know, sometimes we might be into it, but we sometimes to give it a clear description would help and encourage us to, uh, you know, work harder on this issue. One perspective of zikr is by looking at the process of tasbih, which is part of the earlier theme of this surah, you know, glorification of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For example, when you talk about the verbal level of zikr, you know, we sit down after namaz and we do the tasbih. Well, this is what we had been taught from childhood, either in madrasa or the parents told us that, you know, after namaz, sit down and recite the tasbih. So you verbally do it. Allahu Akbar, Alhamdulillah, and Subhanallah, which is okay. There's nothing wrong with it. That is how you start to learn. Then the second point of tasbih would be the reflective level, where you do not only ritually recite it as fast as you can and get over with it, Rather, you think about it. What does Allahu Akbar mean? Remember, we talked about this, these phrases when we talked about the first ayat of Surah Hadid. You know, what does this concept of Allah being Akbar means? And so reflecting on the words that we are reciting regularly is the second level of, you know, a zikr, where you are not only verbally mentioning it, but even thinking about the meaning and the implications of those words. And finally, you reach to the spiritual level of uh, zikr, and that is you have this consciousness of Allah without, you know, going through this process of ritual. You know, let me go back to the example I mentioned earlier uh, when we were talking about uh, tasbih, you know, Niagara Falls. When you go there for the first time, you know, what happens to you as a moment? You know, you say... Subhanallah. Did you think about it? When you said Subhanallah, did you think about it? No. You know, it came from inside. It came onto your lips. In this first one, you were just saying it. The words Subhanallah were on your tongue because you are used to recite tasbih after namaz. You don't really think about it, didn't pay attention to the meaning. And the second one is where you are thinking about it. The third one is where the tasbih is coming automatically from your heart onto your tongue. And that is what you have to you know, progressively move from one level to another. Another important dimension of zikr is the issue of you know, attaining that level where the zikr 
and the consciousness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not in the bounds and the limits of space and time. Does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala live in 9,000 bathers or this Masumin center? You know, sometimes when we act in a way that when we would do things outside, which are not right, but when we come in, into the Islamic center or the Masjid of Imam Baraga, or a religious function, we abide by certain things which will not be abiding with in other places. It means on a subconscious level, Allah resides here. When I'm somewhere else, he's not there. At least on my subconscious, he's not there. And so when he's here, I, you know, I think he's here, therefore I'm more careful when I come to the Islamic center. Or when the time comes up, you know, Muharram and Ramadan, you know what we call Fasli Musliman, seasonal Muslim. You know, when they are Muslim, in, in, in month of Ramadan, yeah, okay, even I avoid even drinks, you know, on the day of Eid, we'll start again. You know, they, they, they are kind of people who think that way. Well, they are basically for the consciousness of Allah is limited by space and time. And that is not a good level of a Muslim or a mu'min. When we talk about zikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it should be there all the time. And that becomes so powerful element of preventing us from committing sins. You know, we drive on the, on the highways. What is the limit there, speed, speed limit here? 100 kilometers. They give us leeway about 20 kilometers extra. You know, but we know if we go more than 120, if I know regularly there is a police car somewhere along my route that I go every day, I will be speeding before it, but close to it I will I'll slow down, even though I don't see him, but I know that, you know, he might be there. This consciousness of presence of a police car that I have not even yet seen prevents me from violating the traffic regulation. You just take that to a higher level. The consciousness of Allah's presence in our life, if it is there, you know, then we will see it will become a very strong element of preventing us from committing sins, violating the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, and this is something we have to think about when we talk about zikr. It's not just reciting tasbih. It is having this consciousness of Allah's presence in our life. And if you have that, that is the most powerful mu'iza that you will need in your life. Then I don't need anything else. I don't even need anyone to guide me. If I have that consciousness of Allah's presence in my life. If you look at the Arafah of Imam Hussain alayhi salam, you know, recited on the... It's a very powerful, very beautiful dua. You know, the introduction of that is a lengthy one, a preamble about Allah's, you know, uh, the grace and blessings. But the actual dua, the very first sentence, Allahumma ja'alni, Ka'anni um, araka. O oh Allah, make me, you know, such that as if I see you. That is the first part of the dua, of dua Arafa. Means that sense of consciousness that as if you are right there in front of me. You look at Surah uh, Yusuf, the beautiful uh, story of, Ibrahim, uh, of uh, Yusuf alayhi salam when he is put in a very challenging situation, there is nobody there to prevent him. You know, nobody can do anything if he wanted to fulfill his de desire. All the elements there are, are there. All the forces urging him, you know, to commit the sin is there. But what stops him? Ra'a burhana rabbihi. These are the words of the Quran. He saw the evidence of his Lord. What does it mean? You know, for the ma'sumin, you know, the result of doing something is not in the ghaib. For them, it is as, as if they're right in the, in, the, in the front. And it was that element that of, you know, the shuhud of what will happen, which prevented him. And so that, that is, you know, this is the zikr that we are talking about. It's not that easy. It's easy for me to say here and, you know, stand here. But I, I hope when you pray, you pray for me also. 
you know, because this is something we need in order to, to move to a higher level. And Allah says, Alam amanu. Has yet not the time come for the mu'mineen to reach to a higher level where their qulub and their hearts have the khushu and humility which is expected from them. Salawat wa alaykum Now what are the elements which prevent the zikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? In a way they are very simple items. But we'll look at the ayat of Quran, only three of them. Uh, number one, wealth. We are not against wealth. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't create the blessings of the dunya for the sinners and the fasiqeen. No. But the relationship is very important. You know, our relationship to the wealth and to this dunya should be that where we are the master and this wealth is our slave, not the other way around. You know, my late father uh, used to give an example where he used to say that, oh, my son, you know, be like the fly which sits on the sugar and not the one which sits on the honey. If the fly sits on the honey, because the fly is attracted to sweetness, when it sits on the honey, after it has, you know, taken whatever it wants, when it wants to fly back, it is stuck. It, you know, because the, the honey is mostly liquid. Whereas the fly sitting on the sugar will take whatever it wants, and then when it's satisfied, it just run, flies away. Our relationship to this dunya should not be such that we become the slave of the dunya. Acquire it in the right way, use it in the right way, and, and that, is, that is the main thing. Otherwise, you know, the wealth itself can become one of the barriers for the zikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is an ayat from Surah Nur, Surah number 24, ayat 37, Rijalun. This is where Allah praises certain people, the mu'mineen, where he says that, Rijalun la tulheem tijaratun wa la bay'an zikrillah. That the mu'mineen, the good people, are those whom tijarat and bay'ah, you know, business and transactions, does not distract them from the zikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and prayers and giving in zakat and yakhafuna yawman tataqallabu fihi al-qulub wal absar and they, they are concerned about the day when things will change even the hearts would be changing second element is, is family we are not against family Islam is a religion of family but again that also can become an element which prevents us from the zikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the amwal has been already mentioned earlier in the, in the first ayat. I use the term family as a more broader, although Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about awlad. That, O oh believers, be careful that your wealth and your children do not distract you unzikrullah from the zikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And those who do that, Allow that to happen, humul khasirun. They are the losers at the end. Mm -hmm. and, and this is where, you know, sometimes family issues or the love for the children um, prevents people from fulfilling what is their duty. We don't have time really to go into history, but just very quickly, you look at the, bat the, the battle of uh, Jamal. One of the leaders on the opposition side was Talha and Zubair. You know who was Zubair? Zubair was as much a cousin of Rasulullah as Amir al-Mu'mineen. Amir al-Mu'mineen is Rasulullah's uncle's son and Zubair was Rasulullah's aunt's son. That's the only difference. Otherwise, their relationship to Rasulullah is exactly the same, both. And he was, for a long time, very close to Rasulullah, very close to Amir al-Mu'mineen. In the incident where the, um, the house of Bibi Fatima Zahra sallallahu alayha was attacked, <coughs> one of the few people who were there with Ali in that house was Zubair. He was also a family member, of course. And he's the one who came out with a sword where, you know, people of the, um, the Sahaba came and then uh, arrested him and uh, 
broke his sword. And so with, he was with Amir al-Mu'mineen. Later on, you see, you go into history, the issue of Jamal happens, and he is one of the two uh, leaders. And Amir al-Mu'mineen used to say that Zubair was with us until his son grew up, Abdullah bin Zubair. It is Abdullah who actually influenced the ideas of his father later on. And so when we talk about this issue that, you know, even awlad can be a basis of taking people f away from the zikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this, this is a reality. <clears throat> and the third element, of course, is the shaitan. In Surah Maidah, number 91, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّمَا يُرِيدُ الشَّيْطَانَ أَنْ يُقَى بَيْنِكُمُ الْعَدَاوَةَ وَالْبَغْضَاءَ فِي الْخَمْرِ وَالْمَيْسِرِ وَيَصُدُّكُمْ عَنْ ذِكْرِ اللَّهِ one of the plans of shaitan is that he would like to yasuddukum uh, to prevent you from the zikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so these are the, the elements that we have to keep in mind all the time. And, and that's, that's, you know, uh, one of the signs of, you know, elevating our level of iman. And that is the zikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not only zikr in a verbal form, rather in the meaning of the consciousness of Allah's presence in our life. Let me, um, you know, the, the rest, inshallah, the rest of the ayat will deal with that tomorrow. Just one point when I use this example of the traffic police. That when we commit sins, on a subconscious level, Allah is absent from our mind. That's why it happens. If the zikr of Allah was there in the meaning of consciousness, that would not have happened. And one way of understanding this is looking at the process of tawbah. What is the meaning of tawbah? In childhood, it means doing this and that, isn't it? Repenting. But if you really look at the Arabic term, it's very interesting. The word tawbah, atubu ilay, or atubu ilayk. You know, means I am returning back. What does it mean? Tawbah means returning back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It means when I committed the sin, O oh Allah, I, have, I had moved away from you. There was a spiritual distance that I created between myself and you. But now I regret, I realize that. And now I'm doing tawbah, regretting that and asking for uh, forgiveness. So even the word sometimes, you know, when you think about it, the word tawbah itself means returning back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is so kind, so merciful. He is kinder to, kinder to us than our parents. He doesn't go anywhere. He is there all the time. It's we who move away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when we do tawbah, we are actually returning back and he is... Physically, you know, figuratively speaking, his hands are still open to welcome us back, provided we do it with sincerity and with remorse. And so that is, that is the, the element of this uh, zikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that that's one of the signs of increasing the level of our iman. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increase our tawfiqat and include us among those who understand the spirit of the Qur'an and the teachings of the Ahlul Bayt alayhi wa salatu wa salam.